start recording. Yeah, yeah. So day two, day two, we're setting everybody here. Everybody's getting going. So, so yesterday we did the printer. We're gonna move right on to the pre-CAD design lesson today. We're gonna get up to well, first of all, get everybody's printer running. So we'll go we'll go in detail through the procedure of how you can kind of understand and troubleshoot it. And then what's important is after we we do that and yeah, the, the main idea is to iterate on the ability to design simple things so you can see, okay, here's an idea to reality and you can really get a good handle on that process, understanding the hardware that you do it with. So what I would suggest was each, each of our groups, each of our five groups will select like a very tiny tiny project, tiny design project. So, hey, how about something like a bit holder or a tool like a razor blade holder, like for example, we have the razor blade or anything we, we choose that's very simple that you can drop literally in like under 30 minutes once you get the basic, basic lesson in the free cat. So you can see that translation, like what are the overall issues of the integrated process, not just the fact that, you know, you bought a printer, you maybe download a file and then you kind of don't know uh, how to create your own. Here it's all about we're building our printers, we're doing the FreeCAD, the open source software, with respect to getting prepared for larger collaborative processes. So, so some of the threads that we have going here are how do we co collaborate in a greater way. I think we can, we can all collaborate, like as far as OSEs work, with the kind of work that we're doing with the plastic recycling and 3D printing as a project that schools can do it, uh, universities can do it. Like for example, there's already a couple of chapters of the Precious Plastic Open Source Project. Actually, there's one in Australia that we're communicating with right now. And let's let's put it all together. So that could apply at the high school, elementary, college level. And then we have the incentive challenge coming up in September. So that's a big one. That's for the, the whole world to participate in. So if we can get all the different levels from you know from schools to to anybody else, that would be a great idea. So here with Ian, we're talking about how do we get this school right here involved in continuing development. How do we get more schools, and how do we develop that? So we make the road by walking and and uh, collaborating as much as we can. And I think if we can bring the entrepreneurship part in there. There's, you know, there's design, there's entrepreneurship, there's coding, a lot of different levels. If we can architect that in a way that we can be inclusive to the number of people that participate, that would be great. With a grander vision of what we talked about, the open source everything store, that people can literally implement the microfactory in their communities. There's open collaborative design that we're all, all working on. And I guess the main insight I have on that is it's lo it's hard work, right? It's like to develop some product with with all the details involved. That's a bit of work, and that's why we need the big teams. And so far, in the history of this project, never really had the huge teams that you have enough people to like cover everything. But in principle, that's possible. Of course, that's challenging because you're coordinating all the different people involved. But that's that's what we have to start doing, and also get used to the idea that we're all working together because once again the biggest challenge is the collaborative literacy where we don't know how possible that is you know but we do have the digital tools right now as I mentioned yesterday from the invention of writing to, to the invention of the printing press to the invention of the wiki we've got the tools where we can collaboratively create and make it happen so today we want to get right into the getting the 3d printers running and get that part so as soon as as soon as we have that as soon as we have everybody we can get going on a free CAD lesson and then move into how to use this same kind of system for other applications so learning into learning a little bit about how the g-code works the, the controlling how do you control this for other functions so we can easily add a pen plotter attachment we can start looking at well how do you generate the actual control um, in a way that you can understand. So, so basically, looking into the code, a little bit of the code, which is G-code, and understanding how that works so you can create your own files or use other software to, to generate files for 
printing or plotting. Uh, plotting applies to circuits. So we'll look into actually, that will be tomorrow, we'll look into more, okay, well how do you start plotting out things for circuits? So we can mount, the, the experiment that's included is getting a couple of circuit boards and actually plotting with a marker and then etching that for an actual real circuit. And then we can actually drill the holes for the circuit elements so we've got a very basic circuit that we'd like to do. But it's still a pretty advanced circuit. It's actually a microprocessor. It's like, holy cow, can we do that? So we've got it, we start with a chip and uh, put a couple of components around it and make, make it to a super minimalistic Arduino. Uh, like we're programming the Arduino right now to run our 3D printer. We can do that in the very most basic implementation. So that would be day three. And then day four, we move on to the Raspberry Pi tablet. And throughout this, we're continually printing. So for the, the drilling part, we're going to print out a drilling attachment for this printer. For the, the, art, for the Pi tablet, we're going to print out the parts, the case, all of that stuff. So we'll, we'll get more experience in using the 3D printer to work with it and getting familiar how it works. And also with the idea that we can make it work for other functions. That's, that's a big thing. So you can put a pen plotter on it. You can put a laser head, small laser on it. You can put a vinyl cutter. Like just a little blade and you can turn it into a vinyl cutter. So we, we can see how, if we have the ability to control it, um, we can make all those functions happen simply by interchanging heads. So once again, the modularity concept. And then using the software that we already have, the, the Marlin firmware that's on this print, printer, we can do a lot with it by just understanding a little bit more how it works and how we can <coughs> modify it for the different purposes, which you can just with the same firmware that we have depending what you tell it to do and, and kind of like the startup sequence, things like that, you can make it do a lot of different things. So that's, that's where we're at. Uh, so we should probably get going on getting all the printers running. So yesterday we had, uh, I took this filament, put it for a couple hours into like 60 degree uh, toaster. <laughs> so hopefully this, uh, this filament, we had issues with what we think, Jeremy, like the print that came out yesterday was just completely bubbly. Um, and I think it was, it's PLA, but we, we think we had a lot of moisture in there, which is weird because I actually haven't seen that kind of thing with PLA, the PLA that I was, using, I was using. But it's quite possible that this may be, I mean, PLA, when you get down to the chemical structure, any plastics in general, I mean, you can have so many variations in terms of the, the process for how you create that plastic. These are polymers, and you can change different parts of the chain around the, how, how the geometry comes together. Marcella. Yeah. Can you show us the print? Yeah, do we have a print? Uh, Somebody <laughs> took it home. All it was was a, yeah, if we find it, we'll definitely document it, but it was just the tower, little like eight centimeter tall tower, but we could see like when we slowed it way, way down, it actually got much more smooth. So first we started about, I think it was 25, standard, like 25 millimeters per second. And it was just out of control. But that's because we're printing a small thing. So yeah, it could be melting a little bit, like not, not having enough time to cool. So we slowed it down to 50%. It still was very bubbly, better quality, but very bubbly, like on the surface, super rough texture. And then we slowed it down to 25% of that. So a quarter of 25, which is about six millimeters per second. And it was much smoother, but still you can see the rough, rough spots on it. The expectation was it would be absolutely smooth. Um, now I've seen exactly the kind of result we got yesterday with uh, thermoplastic urethane, which is known for absorbing water very easily. Like PLA, it shouldn't do it that bad, or at least I haven't seen it. Well, I mean, it does do it, but I've never seen it cause a problem like that, like we had yesterday. So anyway, some of the things we're learning here, uh, we're going to try to actually get another source of the PLA. And I didn't bring mine home from, from Missouri, so we have the different filament here. And uh, that's where we're at right now. So maybe we can just, just quickly before we go, into today 
some impressions from yesterday. Like, what what are some of the salient things that that come out? I, I can start with myself, but for me, it's like once again details. Like, we got the first printer up pretty much by like 7 p.m. Um, we were done and ready to actually uh, test it for the first print. I think once again the the importance of attention to detail, like. Uh, a lot of things from I think the documentation too like the documentation there was a little confusion on that we, it's not perfected yet um, so documentation could definitely use just a little bit more uh, refinement but what were some of the biggest blocks I think we maybe had not enough tools a little bit I guess I would say that as a block Print quality, yeah. We had to do a lot of cleaning. Uh, this is, so maybe we consider for next time, so we do the 1.2 millimeter prints, print head. Maybe we just go and do it with more detail, maybe just drop down to like 0.8 or so. The reason for doing 1.2 is you're like nine times as fast compared to the standard 0.4 nozzles. But maybe, yeah, that was definite issue where we're just cleaning a lot of parts and things that uh, just weren't perfect to begin with. Definitely a bit of time there. Any other impressions of what what could have gone better? Uh, I think coordinating a lot of people is always a challenge. I think maybe today, I don't know if we can focus on the aspect, okay, as soon as you are done, try to find somebody else who's not done on that same step, maybe. Uh, that we find works pretty well. So that means you have to be open on both sides. One, yourself, you have to be proactive. But on the second side, you have to be willing to let people help you because there's a lot of stuff we have here. There's more, um, more things we can do than we have time for. So definitely uh, allow people to help you to make it happen. Um, any other impressions from yesterday? What we could learn for the next time because we're continuing these uh, by the way the next one which is coming up like a month and a half end of april so that's yeah more than about a month and a half we're going to do the one with with the filament maker as the challenge so getting towards the plastic recycling so that's going to be the next one and and we want to do it better and better um, I would just say you, you've already said all the things I would have said anyway, so that's, that's why I'd say with the PT would be the instructions of course making sure everything is as smooth as possible. Yeah. It's quite a tricky day to get through to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. I think you, you kind of have to look at, okay, super detailed on each aspect. And so there's tools, obviously. There's parts. Also workflow. Like, yeah, workflow is a big one. Like, how do you... Uh, one is from how do you how exactly do you sequence the thing so that say there's a dead spot somebody can fill in on a part that's that can be done because there's a dead spot in either in timing somehow uh, and then with the group process how do you really get people to to help out as well so there's a lot on the workflow I think we can do um, yeah even like the parts the way the parts are organized just just like bag them up better, like pack them up, like standardize the packaging. So, okay, you've got this, this bag of, you know, exactly where it is there. Like, I know we did spend a little bit of time looking for some things. Um, yeah, yeah. Really get good at the packaging part, which sounds like it's obvious, but I mean, every second counts. It's like, because there's so many steps. If you had a piece of card and had all the different bolts and screws and identical, so that if you're going for your M618, line it up to the cardboard, and then you say, Yep, yeah, that's the one. And I know you'll know which that bolt is now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That so, little lining up yeah, things. To, a bit yeah. Out. If you just have one piece of card, check on the card. Um, yeah, probably yeah. Just like a refinement of the build instructions, sort of like Lego slash IKEA. Level of abstraction where um, you know it's really 
lay it out really clearly that anyone can sort of pick it up? Yeah, that's what we talked about in the, in the presentation. IKEA style fabrication diagrams. If we get it to that level, that would be really good. Yeah, we're not we don't have that for this this whole build, but maybe that's a thing we can uh, focus on. Maybe you guys can help us do that. You guys got a team here. Yeah, that's excellent. One of those things was the C X system setting that up is a couple of bolts you can or sorry, nuts that you have to put in before you put the X or Y axis, sorry, in place. You mean top of the Z or those or this bit this bit right in here? Oh yeah. So on a X on a Z to X where you had to put them in before that was not in instructions. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, <coughs> details. And these details all add up, so yeah. Yeah. Always could do better. Um, any uh, any other comments on I think main the instructions um, you get it all the way up to a certain step where there's no photos. And then I think on that page uh, or those steps that's where it kind of gets confusing and you really need to you know, have somebody like yourself or uh, working with other groups to try to figure through that. So just having those photos makes it so much more uh, detailed so much clearer. I'm like, okay, I know what the expected result is. I know where I have to get to. Um, so yeah. I think, yeah, making sure, that, like, a really good initial step is to make sure that we've got photos of each step. Be, um, yeah, yeah, just complete some of the missing pictures from the instructions. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Any other comments, or should get get rolling? What I thought was was quite bad yesterday. I don't know whether it was by mistake, but to actually have that finished um, extruder part, so you have actually got to, So I don't know whether, and I know it's hard when you're travelling. If you had a finished model, which is kind of labelled with the x-axis, the y-axis, etc. So when you're creating it, you can actually go up to it and have a look and go, oh, that's what it's going to look like. So it kind of helps. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then, how much of that we we do want that in physical life, and then also in in the FreeCAD too. We we have that. It would help to do some more of these really nice exploded part diagrams that are. We actually have the capacity to do that for like you can explode the parts and view it inside out. Uh, that would help too. So a little bit more of this virtual reality aspect to it. Eventually, we've talked about. A bit like how do you get this so say you have your cell phone and you can uh, literally so it's augmented reality you'd, you'd put the the part in your field of view and then it will tell you like okay how this fits together that would be an excellent app to develop eventually not too hard I mean that technology well exists today so say you got you know one part that you don't even know what it is to start with okay identifies it shows you a picture of where it fits in the whole thing how to actually you know maybe like a little animation to say okay what do you do with that part from now on maybe it could ask you like okay but are you done with this other part if so do this take this part and so forth so it could do like the whole con quality control and all that for you <coughs> so the instructor would be less needed at a point or eliminate I mean yeah all these kinds of developments to make this scale to just better quality more product, more people, it will be fun. And then you can think of, hey, we're building this entire village or whatever, this, this school in a, in a week or a month of time because we've got all that information behind us. That's, you know, that's the possibilities where if we talk about the economies or the local economies, circular economies that are much more resilient, um, that kind of knowledge infrastructure would be key. So there's a lot of software work to be done there. That's, that'll be some good stuff to collaborate on some hackathons I mean, for for that kind of level. That's that's getting pretty advanced. That's that's pretty good stuff. Yeah. Um. I think one reflection is just how much you put it brings together. Mm -hmm. there's, there's so many pieces mm -hmm. to it, but if you just follow the instructions, I like think you just pick up so much about how the machine works and each and every part and what it's doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you get to like down to the wiring and how like the power and all that works and, and whatever your little piece does I think yeah you just learn so much in the fact it's really cool. 
was incredible. You know, when I came in, the knowledge that I had the day before, you know, before we started just looking at this thing, I was like, what the hell is this? How's it going to work? And then by the end of the day, I, I felt like a really good understanding of that, that entire thing um, in my process. So, yeah, you just pick up so much from my day. Yeah, and that's because you're, the main point of that is because you're doing it, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing. you got to get the hands in there and more than the books and all that, so, yeah. Okay. So maybe um, go right into maybe a little overview of what we do. Like, yesterday we, we've gone through one printer. We kind of had, actually, we had to troubleshoot at a deep level. There was actually a bad connection. We found out it was, it was so it was an easy solution. We went through the troubleshooting of one, one printer. Uh, but I think most other people were not looking at that. So maybe we can review what the status is right now. So say you've got the whole printer put together. On one side is all the wiring. And the wiring, uh, we have the diagram that's you guys, since you guys pretty much wired up, well, I guess I did that part, but um, what's the assessment of where, as far as the existing diagram, how much of how much of the wiring does it currently capture? You guys who did some of it, comments on that? It should be, we've got the diagram in a D3D build manual. Um, let me put that. So D3D Universal Build Manual. Let's see, you guys are not seeing my screen. Uh, maybe I can share it. Um, yeah, so let's just go over what we have so that we can make this process just in terms of coordinating most effectively for today. Uh, so going to the build manual, which is on the D3D Universal page. Build manual, item 15, D3D Universal build manual. So in it, uh, on, a, on a main page we have, so there's, one is the mechanical build, build procedure, um, which has at this point like 130 pages, but yeah, it's relatively decent, but yeah, some refining of that would definitely, definitely help clean up, clean up a little bit. So on the wiring part, um, that's the basic diagram. One suggestion uh, that came up yesterday is the potential of having a shield that fits over the top. So the shield pushes on the top, and then you've got other things that can be like That is. Um, so that's the ramp's shield on top of the Arduino. Mm -hmm. Now it does have... You, I guess what you're suggesting would be a dedicated shield mm -hmm. for this specific yeah. printer. Yeah. yeah, and the ramps shield is a generic 3D printer shield, but yeah, if you could make one that avoids, just eliminates everything else we don't need, that's an interesting thing. Now, I'm not saying a complete new shield with all those components, I'm saying just one board that lifts those ends off that pretty much, because obviously we're only using so it wouldn't have any components on it, it would just almost be lifting the connectors away from that board. I suppose it would also protect the board as well. Uh, you, you're saying just a mechanical thing that has the whole pattern yep. of just everything? Up nice and clear. Which you would put on top of it and then you, just even, um, it's like, a, like, an infor like the cardboard idea where it's just the information so it, you just overlay it and then you yep. plug into the recording places. And I haven't thought I about think, that one. That's you're, interesting. You're, you're trying to expose this to more, more students. Yeah. It's easier. The back goes on there, and then they can see, oh, Z-axis motor, Y-axis motor, and that's all the information that's in front of them. It makes it a lot easier. To and those students, who want to understand more, could actually take the shield off, and then it's all important as well. Yeah, there's, okay. There's easy things we can do, like just like templates that you can just superpose and then so you're not implying you're not talking about like say a, a different electronic board that no, you're putting on it's just no, yeah it's just a cover cover which which could easily be done like even you know 3d print that thing and 
Uh, just snap it on, just snap it in place or something like that. That would be interesting. Huh. I mean, if we're talking about making circuits, one of the projects that you can do afterwards would be to make that shield. So once they've got all that understanding, they can actually make that shield, push it on, put all the electronics in there. Yeah. It's, it's good to go because we've done the EFT and that sort of stuff. But yep. then it makes it simpler if there's an issue. Because they can check in, is the, the Z axis isn't going to be straight away to be able to see where So you'd say with the, the circuit making ability to actually design a new like recreate the board it's doable so um, that's that's power user stuff now with this printer right now what we can do quite well would be to, to do holes but milling is limited because you have just one axis and I would just move around like you need a second point of support so like a second Z axis would allow you to do much more in terms of the milling part of actual circuits right now you can it's relatively easy to go up and down but once you start moving that way like because you have one only one support on an x-axis it's just gonna uh, any force on that will make it move so you lose that accuracy but going straight up and down to do CNC hole drilling that's well within the capacity so we'll that's what we'll try uh, tomorrow so yeah yeah. This wire, you've got one photo there. yeah and like that makes it really clear on what that needs to look like and so if you just had photos for each of those or something like you, it'd be really, yeah, so that's that's another really good photo as well. But then the, we got we had different colors on ours, so that, yeah. that was a little bit confusing. But but yeah, like just having those photos just gives it really, really clearly what it needs to look like at the end result. So if you have any questions, you can yeah. photo and be like, oh yeah, does that look Yeah, like let's, let's see how much we can capture that today. Um, Ian, can we maybe allocate some people to that, like try to get a detailed step-by-step -step of the electrical, or is think, that um, not really? We can really do it properly after the fact. After the fact, when okay. When we go back, we've done it before today. Okay. And then when we go and do it later on, we'll really be able to nail it. Okay. Yeah, that's doable. And I'll, I'll try to capture as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. It's about getting that to the higher, higher level of refinement. So, regarding the diagram, so we're saying, yeah, that's not not enough to make it work but you can like for example with the keycad um, already in keycad which we'll learn a little bit about tomorrow you can do something like put that fully into CAD and get a nice three-dimensional image too that you can ex export and you can put that into FreeCAD and then add like your wiring and stuff like that so you can get a nice full full image of that that's and that that's completely doable um, with just understanding the basic processes so putting things into digital format <coughs> Uh, each of those little pieces that goes on a board that could be a little file in a part library that we create for all these projects and then you can completely have power to like mix it around to do renderings and instructions and everything else but it does take a lot of people that's you know that's that's why we're saying talking about the collaboration architecture you can assign all those tasks to people but then you'll see like wow that's like a hundred people right there that could be doing all this stuff because there's so many different steps and you can do that uh, at the level of each module, you know, small part. There's just a lot of lot of things that can be done at the same time. And that's why I was saying that the numbers of people working on this, if you can coordinate them, that will be some amazing things that can happen. So we'll do the electronics. We'll document as much as we can. And then the startup procedure itself. It's written up in the manual as far as uh, startup procedure. So there's controller build, final layout, first run procedure, and troubleshooting. So, and this this applies to everybody. So also for the team in Richmond, uh, I think they can learn from us here. But we can maybe refine some of these instructions here. Those are, let's see. So that's just a separate document there. But this is like read through that first, or and then maybe we can continue adding pictures to it um, put a little bit of D3D universal troubleshooting on there as well like if motors are not moving etc what do you do we should add the kind of stuff we saw yesterday I actually haven't seen that kind of thing with the blinking power thing we can add it to to this so we can continue to to co cover more of the cases now the, the problem is if you cover like all the cases there's just so many cases 
and it becomes like you can't parse the document anymore so uh, that's the other challenge that's why you have to have the kind of like the basic logic level of how you you approach the problem to, to try to troubleshoot it um, but in general the idea is if something is not not working because it's a complex system isolate it you know, remove all the parts like we had basically the power supply was just flashing right so okay we I identified that okay we disconnected something and then okay it worked again so try to do like step at a time try to logic it out okay if this is not moving well what is wrong there's three things it's like the component it's the wire it's the connection and then above all it's like power power is like the obvious like there's something's not plugged in that's like number one but seems obvious but a lot of times not connecting power is a big deal um, so there's the component the wire and the connection itself for the connection just plug it in and out make sure the connection is good wire I mean you can could be a wire could be a broken wire or the component itself so far we haven't had any components that are wrong right now they were all quality controlled before but we did have okay it was just a simple thing as the thing was plugged in incorrectly and you have to watch out for the the, the DuPont co those are called the small pins are called DuPont connectors the black black plugs are called DuPont connectors um, those are small 2.5 millimeter so it's easy to plug it in the wrong position so just take a look at that um, and other than that um, startup procedure so start with that and this gets you all the way to the test print so that's the overview just try to get a feel for that process that's written down we can then go through each each of these to um, do that in real life so any questions or if you got your computers it's worthwhile to get them out and actually each person doing that just make sure you're going through the basics first and then you can get into more okay now there's the troubleshooting and then so that there's a basic startup procedure and troubleshooting idea is if you connect everything and uh, at the end of the day the only thing that's that is not working is if everything is plugged in correctly assume everything works the only thing that we haven't done for the first print is the direction of the motors and the height of the Z probe if you don't know where the Z probe is compared to the nozzle as you have built it you have a room of all the way like between zero and eight millimeters that probe can sense up to eight millimeters away it could be very close could be up to eight millimeters off the bed when it can sense it so you have to adjust that the first very first print once it goes through the it will probe the bed to get the location the z, z location of the bed and that will allow it to adjust completely. The bed is even completely um, at an angle. It will still correct it because it pokes at four places and it establishes a plane. A plane could be a good plane that's actually perpendicular to the table, uh, parallel to the table, or it could be quite, you know, quite skewed. So that's the one thing we need to correct by actually the, that's the baby stepping correction that's uh, within the menu that everyone will have to do and the other thing you have to do is if the motors are are not running the di correct direction you simply reverse the plug on the board so that way so the quickest way to do that you can of course do that by trying to go into the the controller and say okay let's move the x-axis and see which way it moves and then correct it from there but the idea is like before you start it up and actually home the axes you can't really control the machine through the controller because it won't let you do it, it uh, without homing so homing is where it hits the end stops the limit of the motion the little end stops we have uh, before it does that it will not let you control it through the menu so well so so what we're doing there is in the menu just do basically a startup home axis there's a home axis thing so what we do is we home it so it'll go through all three of them 
and easiest thing we found is just hold your finger on a reset button when you see that it's moving the wrong direction just reset it and now we can rapidly go through just hit okay home all the axes you might get lucky and get all three of them going the right direction in the first printer it happened that all four of them which includes the <laughs> extruder were actually in the wrong direction so that's actually a very low likelihood that all four being wrong but we did have that oh yeah oh yeah yeah we're we all got to do this so I'm just explaining like what's up for everybody uh, I will what I, the point I'm making is that once we have the entire thing connected all the wires say they're all good we can figure it out from the diagrams and and look at the model that's already working so we do have a model that's already working um, when that's all correct there's still the two variables one the direction of the motors and the height of the the extruder so just just for your heads up how how this process kind of works and to address the the four directions like so you have to do the three axes plus the extruder the extruder could be pulling filament in or could be sucking it out and it depends on which which way it's plugged in so we have to go through all of them the three directions the xyz are done just by hit the home axes now for the extruder you have to first take it up to temperature because it won't let you extrude without that if you go through the menu just go up to temperature so you're testing at that same time you're also testing whether your heating is working and all that which you should see the light light up for the heater uh, but once it's, it's a temperature you can go move and move the extruder and then when you go positive and you just turn the knob in order to activate the extruder and when you go in a positive direction, it should be spitting filament out. If it's sucking it back in, you have to reverse your plug. Uh, hit the reset and and do the reverse the plug. The only warning there is uh, there is just one thing that you have to do: do not unplug it before you hit the reset, because if the motors are energized, unplugging them will fry the the stepper drivers. So make sure that before you do any switching, you have reset the machine. Because uh, when... Uh, that will be the safest. It's also doable to you just press the reset and switch. Um, reset is good enough as long as you don't turn it on before you by some accident. Power is the safest, but I mean the reset I think that works pretty well without getting into trouble as long as you make sure you've done it. So, yeah, but just that one warning, like right now, we don't have enough replacement parts that if everybody fries their <laughs> their drivers, uh, that is, uh, make sure you don't do that because we wouldn't be able to run, we maybe have like three or four replacements, but definitely not enough for all the printers, so. So can you repeat that? How do you put yeah. it into a loop? Yes, so when we're correcting the direction of the stepper motors, you cannot unplug or plug in the stepper motors when the machine is uh, after, right after you did the motion, when the motors, at the time you do the motion, the motors turn on yeah. and they stay on, they don't just go off. If a motor is engaged even if it's stopped, it's got power going to it. The way that, that the steppers motor motors work, once it's engaged, it will hold. It's not, you can't just spin it once it's engaged. It holds and it uses energy and it's, there's current flowing through it. So whether it's moving or stationary engaged, you cannot unplug it. It will fry the little stepper driver chips, the things that we plugged in. So you need to hit reset or pull, pull the plug. That's that's the thing. So that's the only warning for in terms of like dangerous parts for smoking the components. Beyond that, uh, everything is pretty good. So we can get get right to it. Okay. And the people on um, in Richmond, um, if you got any questions, contact us. Make sure you do this. Uh, Chris, um, I think the procedure is pretty well defined. Let us know if you have any questions.
guys are kind of ready to roll in. Yeah.